Uh, I was unbelievably fortunate. Uh, I was a student at Harvard, and the first computers, one of the first computers was built there. It was a very slow, big, bulky machine and uh, made of relays, telephone switches, and clumped along very slowly. The people in charge of it, its inventor, Howard Aiken, uh, did not see that it potentially could do wonderful things, the kinds of things we were so used to in our pocket computers and telephones and everything else. And in fact, he dismissed some students who saw the possibility of a computer uh, making its own programs better by searching little spaces of possibilities. And uh, so that pioneering project started by making tables. I think it had to do with uh, the firing patterns of, of uh, artillery, uh, a direct military application. I just happened to be in the right place at the right time maybe three times in a row uh, at Harvard when the first computer project there was, was existed but was dying out. And then at Princeton where one of the first computers was again being uh, created and used for much more imaginative purposes. And uh, then uh, few years later at MIT, and when I became an assistant professor, uh, beginning my teaching career, uh, the situation was that the older faculty was very used to the analog computers, which could do wonderful things, but only within very limited range of possibilities. And the digital computers, which were on the rise, were understood only by the younger students. And I became the hero or leader of the, of the uh, young students. And uh, it was my job to push the older professors out of the way and make room for the uh, next generation of, of kids who knew more. I graduated from college in 1950, and uh, then I had the fortune to move to Princeton for graduate school and found myself surrounded by a small collection of perhaps the best mathematicians in the, in the whole planet, because one of the side effects of World War II was the migration from Europe of a large number of great physicists and mathematicians. I found myself in an environment where if I had a problem in mathematics, I could walk down the hill uh, about a quarter mile and uh, drop in on von Neumann. John von Neumann was perhaps the, uh, one of the most uh, highly regarded mathematicians in the world at that time. And I'd just pop in there and ask him my question and uh, very likely he'd answer it or he'd say that's not the right question to ask or whatever. And uh, the telephone would ring. He'd pick it up and listen for a while. He said, no, I can't do that. I only do mathematics. That happened twice. And I was very impressed and said, when I grow up, I'm going to, I hope I'll get a phone call and answer it that way. Will machines ever be as intelligent as people? That's a question that worries many people. And the answer is uh, yes, 
unless something terrible happens, the intelligence of computers and their programs will keep increasing. And in each aspect of cognition and life and, in, and problem solving and understanding, uh, computers will uh, get better, uh, whereas people will also get a little better. But that's a matter of how cultures develop. Uh, one problem with people is that when someone becomes very good at a certain skill, uh, then when that person dies, the skill is lost because we don't have an explicit representation yet of how a human brain does any complicated thing. A lot of the uh, work that we did in the 1960s and 70s, uh, when computers were starting to rapidly increase in power, came from ideas that had been developed in the Office of Naval Research by, by promoters who found young people and hired them to build the fastest computer, build the, build the programming language that you can talk to in English, do this, do that. Uh, I was inspired by a couple of those folks who asked, asked the young people to do things that seemed impossible. And they had the money, uh, which wasn't very much, uh, to take uh, a dozen young people and say, we're going to support you for five years. Uh, go and do this thing. And we did. Yes, there's not enough support for basic research, which is characterized by not paying off for five or six years, and then, uh, in the best case, leading to new fields and uh, rapid developments. So there's no way a young person can live through that vacuum of five or six years of no support. So they have to do something much less imaginative than what they could have done. I love the idea of a Frontiers of Knowledge Award. Uh, first, because it, th the committee in charge of it is deliberately looking for new and exciting things. And of course, because the award is quite substantial, and it means that the recipient has a chance to start over, can start a new career. Uh, explore ideas that that he or she has never had time to think about, and so forth. So a substantial prize can be a, a very creative and liberating force. The smaller awards for younger people are, are also very important. 